welcome to Sustainably Speaking with me, your host, Joe Mosca. Clean air. It's vital to our health and well-being, but many communities suffer from poor air quality due to pollution. That's why I'm excited to bring you our next guest, Dr. Shahir Mazari, who is an expert in air pollution modeling and climate change. Dr. Mazari is a published researcher and scientist receiving his doctorate and master's degree from Harvard University. He's also traveled our country speaking with other climate experts and disaster survivors. I think his train is getting in shortly. Let's go meet up with him now. Doctor, nice to meet you. Likewise, great to meet you. Yeah. Very excited to have this conversation today. As am I, you know, I think uh, this is what it's all about, outreach, communicating the, the, the science and the work that we do. Right. Tell me about how your research relates to Orange County, specifically around air quality and air pollution. Sure, well, one of the good things about air pollution research is uh, it really uh, is relevant to so broadly to populations all across the world, including Orange County. A big part of what I do is air pollution exposure modeling. Monitoring sensors are all over the county, but to really understand the full story of air pollution, we wanna know what air quality is like in between those monitoring stations. You know, a, a very important question that is on the minds of a lot of folks are, um, is the fact that climate change is very closely linked um, to air quality. Um, and so what does your re research say about how addressing air quality could actually combat climate change? I mean, it's a great question. Air quality is probably the biggest co-benefit that you get when you tackle climate change. Uh, when we retrofit the energy grid, when we shift away from fossil fuel sources, we have an immense uh, public benefit by just reducing air quality levels. Interestingly, the majority of the air pollution that we're all exposed to, uh, whether it be traffic related or industry related, comes from the combustion of fossil fuels. So the more we can shift away from those dirty energy sources, the better it is for not just the climate, but for all of our health. A lot of times people really feel like climate change is a very large issue, and it is a very significant issue. And, you know, maybe people feel like they can't really do anything in their own personal lives, but with a CCA, they can use more renewable energy. What other things can, can people do in Orange County to kind of reduce air, air pollution and improve air quality and then also combat climate change? Yeah, well, what you pointed out is spot on. And I just want to mention that, you know, 60% of our uh, electricity still in the United States is derived from fossil fuels, which is an absurd fraction given what we know about climate change. The purchases that one makes, uh, transportation, there's a train that is operating here in Santa Ana, which is helping to bring a lower carbon footprint to the everyday commuter who chooses to, uh, to hop on the train. But also our cars, you know, right. driving, uh, Cars that are actually powered by electricity is a big step in the right direction. Uh, solar pa uh, panels on your roof. A very direct benefit of, let's say, electric cars is that you are not combusting at the source. So the tailpipe emissions of the cars driving in and around where people live, where people ride bikes, is a big part of why traffic pollution is so bad for us. Uh, but the more electric cars we have, the more we set the stage for that greater energy transition, and basically the overall greening of the grid. So what role does Orange County Power Authority and renewable energy play in improving air quality? So I think it plays an important role. I think the first step really in uh, you know, community choice energy is giving communities that choice to make the decisions about you know, the energy that they're sourcing uh, you know, to power their communities. In the United States alone, we still have 60% of our electricity generated from these really arcane sources, uh, fossil fuel sources, coal and gas. And uh, that transition towards renewables can't happen quickly enough. We have seen these increasingly dire international um, IC IPCC reports talking about just how little time we have uh, to address climate change and reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. You know, if we can't wait for government to make the action, take the action quickly enough, we need to see action at the local level. And I think that's where uh, OCPA and other uh, local level power authorities are really helping to bring that about. So you've been doing a lot of traveling around the country um, and talking to communities about the impacts of climate change. 
tell us about those travels and, and what you've heard on the road. Yeah, so in 2018, my wife and I launched uh, On the Road for Climate Action, which was a project to really bring climate science to as many doors and neighborhoods as we could uh, in a, a six month or so period. So we traveled from California across the country all the way uh, northeast to Boston, all the way south to Florida, and visited about 42 different states wow. in that time period, interviewing people about climate change, frontline communities about their experience with extreme weather and climatic variation, including farmers who have worked the land for generations. And what we uh, encountered on that road trip was really just the story of climate change as opposed to you know just the graphs and pie charts. In one case we interviewed a farmer in Minnesota who shared about an extreme uh, rain event that they had where they saw 17 inches of rain in just a 24-hour period. I asked him what that like he said it was hillsides collapsing it was um, you know trees washing down the roadside people who have lost their homes in wildfires uh, as we traveled through California. You know the the story of climate change is the collection of those individual stories, which in many cases are very heart-wrenching. In Texas, Hurricane Harvey had recently caused the biggest downpour in a single storm in U.S. history. And this was, you know, some parts of Texas, six feet underwater or so. Uh, he lost both of his cars and there was no insurance coverage because those cars were swept away and, and totally gone. So there's really no proof uh, of, of damage. I don't think we should take them lightly. Uh, of course, it's difficult to attribute any single storm to climate change, but we should be paying attention to these patterns of increasingly severe weather. Your research with respect to health and its, its connections to, to air pollution and climate change, can you tell us a little bit about that? Air pollution is uh, very clearly associated with um, respiratory diseases, asthma, of course, um, you know, even cardiovascular disease, interestingly. And in the United States, we've got about a 7% prevalence of asthma in our society. Uh, this is strongly linked to air pollution. You know, air quality is something that uh, you know, when we improve it, we all benefit from it. But air pollution still varies very regionally. And in fact, how it varies tends to follow patterns of socioeconomic divergence. And we see oftentimes uh, communities that are already disadvantaged, low-income communities that are bearing the brunt of air pollution, both in terms of exposure, but also the health effects. Yeah, you do see, especially in, in Santa Ana, you do see a lot of folks living closer to the freeway than other parts of, of Orange County. That's exactly right. The freeway is a great example. Uh, we often see lower income communities right uh, alongside those freeways. And of course, that's right where your air pollution is the highest. Is this something that, that we're just really as a society um, looking more and more into the, the, the links between air pollution and, and health? Well, I think one of the reasons is uh, the major wildfires that we've been seeing across the whole country and really across the world have been, I think, putting air pollution right on the headlines of uh, you know, news stations. Massive air pollution comes from wildfires, of course. And we saw you know, Washington, D.C. and New York City in a huge plume of air pollution, I think it was last summer. I got media inquiries from New York asking me about my wildfire and air pollution research because uh, it's not something that they've actually dealt with too much. Air pollution health research has gone on for um, decades, but what's newer and is increasingly receiving attention is that environmental justice component. We, of course, would want to see environmental protection uh, universally across the board, regardless of where you live or, or who you are. For me, I've started seeing more and more of, of the conversation evolve as we're talking about um, more electric use within homes. I think uh, electrifying households is a great way that we can improve air quality, both by reducing um, the demand of natural gas, um, but also by improving indoor air quality by not using those combustion sources in the home, which produce nitrogen dioxide, uh, which isn't good to breathe. Uh, indoors. Fossil fuels don't end at their delivery to cars or uh, you know energy power plants. Um, we are in fact running the interior of our homes with natural gas aka yeah, methane. Yeah. A fire right happening in your in your kitchen and it's releasing nitrogen dioxide which is um, you know not good for our health either. In fact it's one of the core pollutants that's regulated at the federal level. It just happens to be outdoor regulation for ambient right. air quality. Uh, we don't have indoor air quality standards. And in fact, oftentimes, the indoor environment is the most polluted environment in the country. Right. And that's where we spend most of our time. 
So I guess that also underscores the importance of electrifying homes and how when we electrify our homes and we're suddenly using electric stoves, um, electric heating, we get to see dramatic improvements in our own health as well. Again, related to the inhalation of those combustion products not taking place. You know, one of the things that we can be grateful for, I think, um, is that our air quality has improved dramatically over the decades, but that didn't come by accident. That came because we had uh, government and a society that recognized the importance of clean air as we were coming out of the 50s and 60s, really woke people up to the importance of controlling air pollution. Consequently, we've really benefited as a society from all the laws that were passed that helped us to uh, clean up the air. And I think it just underscores the importance of, uh, you know, coming together, recognizing uh, problems and challenges in the environment, um, but also tackling those. Well, thank you for sharing so much really good information from your travels, from your book, from your research. It really does make a difference. So thank you being with us. Absolutely. Well, hey, thanks again uh, for taking the time with me and thanks for what you're doing with the Orange County Power Authority. Again, it's a really important part of the story that needs to continue to unfold as we think about both improving air quality and combating climate change. All right, so we have uh, one second before our train comes, but yes. before we leave, what is one thing that you want folks to take away from this conversation today? I think that one thing people can take away from this conversation is that it's not too late to take action and that individuals can make a difference. Excellent. All right, well, let's go catch our train. All right, let's do it. All right.